Um, my name is Blair, um, my pronouns are she, her, and this is Ambisonics and the Great Outdoors. Uh, so as I mentioned, my name is Blair. Um, I am an associate technical sound designer at Team Audio, and my credits include Modern Warfare 2019 and Warzone. But really, I'm just a nature lover and spatial audio fanatic. So what is spatial audio? Well. We can break that up into three main categories. Uh, spatial audio is the sound's position, the space the sound is in, and the ear that hears the sound. And we're gonna go through each of these categories one by one, starting with the sound's position. But in order to talk about a sound's position in a virtual environment, we have to understand how we perceive the position of a sound in a real environment. So how does the human body interact with audio? Well, we can break that up into two main categories. Uh, the human body interacts with audio with the head-related transfer function, or HRTF, and the folds of the ears. And these two concepts combine to create something called binaural audio. But the head-related transform function, uh, to clarify what that is, is it's really just the difference between when you play a sound on one side of your head and that ear hears it versus when you play it on the opposite side of the head and the same ear hears it. Um, it's how the shape of the head interacts with audio. The folds of the ears, as I mentioned, that's really just positioning sound um, a little bit more clearly, uh, but that combines with the HRTF to create this concept called binaural audio. So when we talk about binaural audio, we're talking about simulating the shape of the head and the folds of the ears. Traditionally, however, we don't really use binaural audio in video games. Uh, most games use a channel-based audio approach. So that means that for each speaker, there is a channel of audio. There aren't any differences between the channels of audio that are being fed to the speaker system and the speaker number themselves. Um, Dolby Atmos, for example, uh, is uh, generally 714, I believe. Uh, at least that's what this image is here on the right. Um, what that means is it's got seven, uh, seven speakers on the horizontal plane, four speakers above, and one subwoofer. But however, when there's in this traditional game audio signal flow, the spatial resolution of the player's audio is going to be limited to the amount of speakers that they have. And this creates an equipment inequality with our players. Because ultimately, we can't all have setups like this. We can't have a million different speakers for hyper-positionally accurate gameplay. Instead, what I would suggest that we use is something called ambisonics. Ambisonics is a technology used for the simulation and or capture of an environment's audio, including height, by the way. Um, what does that mean? Well, when we break up this sphere, this uh, sphere of potential listening uh, positions that sound can come from, uh, if we break that up into, let's say four uh, points, uh, that is first order ambisonics. Uh, nine points would be second order. 16 points is third order, up to fifth order ambisonics, which is 36 points, sample points for each, um, each point on the sphere, rather is broken up into Sorry, let me rephrase. Um, uh, the sphere broken up into 36 sample points is fifth order ambisonics. It's effectively how many speakers, virtual or actual, we break up a sphere into. And that's ambisonics. Ambisonics came about around the 70s, um, but it wasn't really widely used 
until virtual reality and digital signal processing. Um, there may be some research people who might beg to differ with me on this. Um, really digital signal processing uh, allowed for widespread use of ambisonics. Um, and virtual reality in general allowed for consumers to use ambisonics in their, well, in their gameplay experiences. So ambisonics is a technology that provides for varying amounts of spatial resolution based on the order of ambisonics used. So if we go back to that sphere uh, of all possible positions that a sound could come from, we would sample that at four points for first order ambisonics up to fifth order ambisonics, which would sample that at 36 points. With a, uh, and that would result in a much higher spatial resolution or spatial accuracy uh, for listening. So when we talk about that spatial resolution, uh, generally that's referred to as something uh, with spherical harmonics. And I'm not gonna go into that because quite frankly, it's a little bit dense, but this is generally the, um, this is generally the diagram that people will point to. And what I want you to take away from this is just as the order of ambisonics increases, the more specific each sample point gets, the less amount of audio information that sample point has to communicate, but the more uh, sample points there are. And ambisonics allows for us to immerse our players more fully and equally because ultimately when we use ambisonics in conjunction with binaural audio, we're able to really mitigate this equipment inequality that comes from one player playing on a 5-1 setup, but another player playing on headphones. Um, Cause we, as, game developers effectively need to design for multiple different speaker setups. But ultimately, Ambisonics allows for us to do so a little bit more easily. So I believe that Ambisonics uh, provides a good solution for the sounds position, providing good, high quality positional information. And I believe it can also provide a solution for uh, the space that the sound is in. Because ambisonics, if we're using ambisonics to simulate the position of sounds, that opens up the possibility for highly spatialized, precise, and immersive convolution reverb. Convolution reverb is a type of reverberation, reverb, echo, whatever you want to call it, um, that takes a impulse response or a frequency sweep or really even a gunshot in space. Um, a sound recorded in an environment and it differentiates that between the sound that was played. So by differentiating, say, um, a frequency sweep file and the frequency sweep played in an environment, we're able to come up with that sound information, that difference, that reverb. Because of that reverb, sorry, let me restart that sentence. Um, there are no high order ambisonic impulse responses of exteriors on the market at this time. Because convolution reverb, while that opens up the possibility for highly spatialized and exciting information to be carried within the reverb that we have, right now, there aren't any exterior uh, impulse responses that are in high order ambisonic. Think about what we could be hearing in our games. We could be hearing sound bounce around us um, like a cityscape from downtown San Diego or the trees uh, carrying and bouncing and muffling sound in a really interesting way. We could be hearing all of these environments in our games, but because there aren't any uh, high order ambisonic impulse responses of exteriors out there, we're not. 
So I'm trying to fix that by recording third order ambisonic impulse responses and exteriors across California. So ambisonics is a technology that allows for the simulation and or capture of the 3D sound of an environment, including height, basically taking that sphere of possible positions and dividing it up into an amount of points. But when we take all of that information, we need to turn that into something that the player can listen to because the player isn't going to have 36 speakers. They're going to have two, or they're going to have a 5-1 setup, or maybe even Dolby Atmos. So converting that format to the ear that hears the sound is done through something called a binauralization plugin. Uh, generally, however, uh, P the PS5 accepts ambisonic input or object-based input uh, from the game. So we don't need to use a binauralization plugin for that particular console. But for the Xbox Series X and PC, while they do have native Dolby Atmos support, it's still a channel-based approach. So it still depends on the amount of speakers that you have. And ultimately, for developers shipping on P the PC, and on Xbox Series X, binauralization, or the converting of, let's say, fifth order ambisonic audio, the converting of any form of ambisonic audio to a listenable format. That conversion, or binauralization, must happen on the game side via a plugin. Luckily, there's a lot of plugins out there for this, especially THX Spatial Audio, which is something that I'm very excited about personally. Um, it, uh, Oculus Audio SDK is a tried and true um, method that's, uh, I believe Phasmophobia uses this, but ultimately it struggles with handling more than two speakers. Uh, Atmoki Ears allows for customizable HRTF based on age. Um, that is to say, it is really useful for adjusting for if you're uh, a child or a teen, uh, I believe are the settings that it has. Um, but THX, uh, THX Spatial Audio uh, is something that I'm very excited about because it allows for multiple speaker setups to be converted to. That is to say, it allows for the conversion of ambisonic audio to a 5-1 setup or a headphone setup, or a 714 setup, but all within the same plugin. With binauralization, we can terrify, because binauralization allows for all of that positional information to be simulated. Speakers no longer have to be physical. They can be virtualized. It could be right behind you and you wouldn't have to have a speaker there. Because ultimately, with binauralization, we're able to take the positional information from ambisonics and convert it into a smaller channel amount, uh, whether that be stereo or Dolby Atmos. So there are a few limitations to most binauralization plugins. Um, for instance, the Oculus one is only stereo um, and everyone does have a different HRTF uh, or head related transfer function. So what might sound really positionally accurate for one person, depending on the HRTF that is used in the plugin, it might not for another. So these are just things to be aware of. However, I believe that ultimately modern games can use ambisonics and binauralization to achieve high quality spatial audio. That is to say, ambisonics allow for us to simulate the sound's position in a positionally accurate way. We can take an environment and instead of breaking it up to, let's say, a 5-1, uh, set up, we can sample it 
at up to 36 different channels. And from there, we can simulate the reverberation of that space on those channels and convert that all into something that the player can listen to regardless of their speaker setup. Thank you. Yeah, questions? <laughs> um, you mentioned that you capture impulse, re impulse responses in the city using a third order ambisonic microphone. So I wanted to ask what, I mean, where do you place the, the chirps, the sweeps that you play? How many chirps would you play and where would you place them? Um, I am in the process of recording impulse responses. I have yet to, um, I have yet to practically record in the city at this point. Um, I'm in the process of making that happen. Uh, but if I, um, off the top of my head, um, I would be careful with placing it directly in the center of the street because that would result in potential um, phasing issues. That's really something that I wanna be careful of when I do record in the city, is I wanna be careful of phasing issues. So I would probably place that speaker in roughly off center uh, like just a little bit off center uh, enough so that like if this was a um, if this was a two way street, I would place it in one lane of traffic. Um, obviously not while cars are going by, but um, that's how I would do it because I would worry about facing otherwise. And that way we can say, okay, this is how one, uh, one area kind of sounds, and from there you can kind of build out through different positions. Um, you can build out different types of impulse responses. Um, you could try it on the sidewalk, you could try it um, in a tighter uh, city street. Yeah, there's really a million different ways to do it, but that's just how I would do it. Got it. And one last question. Maybe you can give your, uh, your thoughts of how to transition from 3DUF capturing to 6DUF rendering. I mean, how would the uh, ambisonic uh, uh, static place that the ambisonic was captured from being utilized in a 6DUF gameplay? All right. Um, in terms of converting from uh, various capt uh, singular captured um, impulse responses to uh, six DOF gameplay. Um, I would say that I honestly don't have a great answer to that question, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I just would record as much information as I could with uh, individual sample points and kind of like ambisonics try and mitigate the um, I would try and take those sample points and build from that a particular image if you will um, I don't have um, I don't have a great answer for you unfortunately in regards to uh, the six degrees of freedom. Um, but that being said, um, I would say that if you were doing six degrees of freedom, try and record with multiple, um, multiple microphones at the same time, potentially. That uh, I know Zillia has a uh, six degrees of freedoms, like time coded linked setup that uh, they use that's something to look into potentially. Thank you so much. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, <clears throat> are, uh, is ambisonics or binauralization um, impacted or reliant upon standardizations of like other audio protocols or standards in 
um, volume and format and platform, like do a number of things have to be aligned to make, to maximize the effect of ambisonics and binauralization? Is that making sense? Yes. Um, you're, are you basically asking if ambisonics is a fit for every game? Yes, every game and every platform and um, every sound format. Like, are there external influences that really throw a wrench in the gear of this having yes. the desired effect. Yes, very much so. So I find that um, building a game for PC and current gen consoles, um, especially if that is a first or close third person uh, game, like a RPG type layout, that is where Ambisonics really shines because then there's because uh, there is a little bit of a performance cost, as I understand it, um, with Ambisonics um, because it's handling that much more um, information. But that's not something that, as I understand it, is much of a problem unless you're going into, say, the PS4 and um, potentially going into uh, mobile and things like that. So. If I was building a RTS, I would maybe not use Ambisonics. Really, I'm presenting this as a tool, uh, if that makes sense. I'm because I'm finding that in the types of games that I have worked on and am working on in the future, I have found that Ambisonics has provided me with more information and more, more gameplay information, really, um, for the player. So this is all to say, no, Ambisonics is not a one-size-fits-all uh, one solution. Perfect. Thank you. Hi, Blair. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm wondering, as an indie developer, how Ambisonics might be able to be integrated into my work. Um, and if there are any cool ideas for gameplay that would be really awesome with Ambisonics that you have and would like to share. Yeah. Um, so Ambisonics is ultimately, uh, that would be where you would set, like you would set up your listener to use a, an Ambisonic format. Uh, if you're, say, making a first-person horror game, let's use Phasmophobia, for example, because I love that game, and I die a lot in it. Um, but uh, if you're making, say, Phasmophobia, um, you would set your listener to third-order, fifth-order ambisonics, whatever you deem gives you the right amount of balance between performance and, um, and audio information. And from there, um, you can take that. Um, and when you play sounds, uh, whether they be mono or, um, well, I think they would have to be mono in this particular case. Um, but when you play sounds and it's picked up by that listener, uh, that would then get converted down to the, uh, the listener's format through the binauralization plugin. Um, I'm so sorry, I lost my train of thought. Can you please repeat your question? Uh, yeah, I asked uh, as an indie developer how I might be able to integrate Ambisonics and if you have any awesome gameplay ideas that would be absolutely perfect with Ambisonics. Okay. Um, I think gameplay wise, um, Ambisonics is really good at emphasizing positional information. So if you want to be able to say, hey, there's a sound exactly there, Ambisonics is great at that. Um, so really, in terms of gameplay, um, it's, it's really limited by what you want to do with your sound design. Um, and in terms of integrating it as an indie developer, um, uh, kind of like the previous question was saying, uh, it is a bit limited by the platform and the um, yeah 
really it's limited by the platform and the genre of game. Um, so ultimately, I don't see any reason why an indie developer might not be able to use Ambisonics um, if they're shipping on the same platform as uh, a larger developer might be. Um, yeah, I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Blair. Thanks for the talk. Um, it's cool to see interest in spatial audio. There's a lot of folks here. So um, when I was looking into spatial audio maybe five or six years ago, it seemed that the variation in HRTFs from person to person um, was a big hurdle at the time. And I was, I guess, hoping to see that with a lot of the VR you know, steps forward that have been happening that um, there might be some advancements in that, but it seems like that's still um, kind of an obstacle. Are you aware of any recent research or steps forward to combat that? Um, a lot of spatial audio developers, uh, like taking the THX spatial audio, for example, um, they're focusing on, they provide an out of the box, uh, in their words, high quality. Um, HRTF, but there's also people are trying to implement a the personal the personalized rather um, HRTF of uh, each consumer. So um, I think with um, with the THX spatial audio, the goal is to implement like you would take pictures of your head and from different angles and then send that off to uh, THX and they would generate an HRTF for you. Um, that is really the only big advancement with that that I've noticed. I think a lot of people are trying to make a one size fits all. Um, and I, if I recall correctly, um, there are different companies that are trying to work on um, customizable solutions, like with preset type um, HRTFs. But ultimately, that is still a hurdle. Um, customizable HRTF, if someone makes that plugin, like, like a plugin with uh, swappable HRTFs based on your, um, based on your age, based on uh, your head shape, and you can pick the one that's best suited for you, that that is something I would be interested in seeing. But ultimately, I think the closest we're getting is uh, the promise of personalized um, HRTFs from THX at this point. Cool.